encourage us and challenge us. This morning we return to the third chapter of the Gospel of John. Third chapter of John, we'll be looking again at the first ten verses. We began this passage last week, and, and we made it through the first three verses. And uh, so we'll look at this passage and summarize some of the points that may be obvious, and we're going to dig a little bit deeper into some of the other places. So, um, John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Five times in that passage, we have a reference to being born again or born from above. Jesus is saying that for anyone to enter the kingdom of God, that realm of salvation, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, that that person must be born again. It's the doctrine of, of regeneration, of, of, a, of giving new life, uh, the very heart of the understanding of salvation. In that Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. But it, it's not a command. It, it's a statement of fact. Uh, we, you can't live in God's kingdom unless you are a partaker of that divine nature of God. Unless you are a new creation. <coughs> uh, the, the word is literally, when it says you, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, you cannot. You do not have the ability, he tells us. We do not have the ability to enter the kingdom of heaven unless we are born again. We talked last week about that, this analogy of, of this birth, um, that we would be able to understand that. Um, we understand that we did not participate in our own birth. That happened, happened to us, not by us, right? And it, it's something that happens to us and not by us. And Jesus says, the same is true of your spiritual birth. It happens to us and not by us. There's nothing that we can do to, to make that happen. Spiritual birth happens to us. And, and Jesus is saying that the kingdom is only open to people who know it is 100% a divine miracle of God, a work of God that saves us. It's nothing that we do in our own effort. We talked last time about the, the four different aspects of the kingdom of heaven that we see in, in Scripture. And uh, uh, but this, this passage focuses upon this, this church age, the time between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And the kingdom of heaven in that time, here's a definition, the kingdom of heaven is the rule of Christ in the hearts of man. The rule of Christ in the hearts of man. That's what he's talking about, being born again, that we would have, have Christ within us. And we talked about that, and so that is, that is what the focus is here, uh, in that kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. The, the theological word about salvation is that it, it is monetary, boy, I can't even say it, monetaristic, 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 that is the word, surely, and she's shaking her hand at me. <laughs> I know, it's monetaristic, not synergistic. And that means it's wholly a work of God. It's apart from man. It's one, mono, one. It's, it's a God thing. Okay? It, it's a God only thing. The sinner must be recipient of that divine miracle. So last week we introduced this passage with a three part outline. And we talked about in this passage we see a sinner's worry. And then we 
we see uh, and we see that with Nicodemus uh, coming with anxiety and fear of not being part of the kingdom of heaven. And he comes and talks to him. And the second part was the Savior's word. And Christ responded and said, you must be born again. And then and the third part of that, which we didn't get to last week and we'll finish this week, is the Spirit's work in this process. So let's step back just a bit and talk about the sinner's word that we saw last week in Nicodemus. Nicodemus, the Pharisee, the guy that has reached the pinnacle of, of his religion, right? Not, not only is he a Pharisee, but he is a well-respected teacher of the law. He, he is, he's not just a Pharisee. He is, he is the teacher of Israel. He is one of the most respected men in all of Israel. He's a member of the Sanhedrin, one of the 70, the ruling crown council, basically the supreme court of the land, right? Uh, in the day. Uh, all of these things are about Nicodemus. And he hears this guy talking and saying things that don't make It's different than anything he's ever heard. And within him, we see some anxiety and some fear as he comes and he says, how can this be? <laughs> what, is, what is the deal? Jesus says to him, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you were born again. And, and, and we see that within him. Uh, and he's like, I've lived my whole life in this process of here's the things that you do to be righteous. Right? We, we observe these feasts and we do this on the Sabbath and we do these things. And this, this is all the stuff that we do so we can be righteous. And Jesus says, <laughs> that'll get you 100% nowhere in the kingdom of heaven. All those things that you do, no. No, that, that's not the deal. You must be born again. And uh, Nicodemus recognizes Jesus as someone unique and different. We, we know you must be from God because we're seeing these miracles, right? We're talking about the miracles happening everywhere. People getting healed, all this stuff is going on. They haven't seen that for hundreds and hundreds of years. They haven't been a prophet for 400 years. Let alone some of the miracles and things that had happened in the time of the Old Testament. They were legend. They had heard the stories. But they were seeing these things happen before them in a two-week period, that, that time of this first Passover that Jesus is in his ministry and this and this this feast of unleavened bread that follows the week after that. In this two-week period, they're seeing all kinds of miracles happen. And he says, I, I'm supposed to be this guy, right? This this, this Pharisee, all of this stuff, people come to me looking for answers. And I see you doing things that I can't do, that no man can do. We know you, you must be from God. And uh, so we see that happen. And uh, uh, Jesus, you know, when he goes to him, he says, we know you must be from God. And Jesus responds to his question. He says, right, I tell you the truth. You cannot see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. So that had nothing to do with this question about you must be from God because Jesus, remember we talked about in the end of chapter 2, he knew the hearts of men that wasn't really the question Nicodemus had Nicodemus says you, you must be from God and Jesus says you're trying to start a conversation but what you really want to know is how do you enter the kingdom of heaven and I'm going to tell you that you can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again Jesus is on missions, he knew he knew what was in the heart of man, he knew the question he knew the guilt. He knew the worry that was in the heart of Nicodemus. And he reaches out to them and, and tells him that. And so that is the, the sinner's worry that we see that. And then we see that Savior's word as he responds to that. And uh, you, you have to have a new nature. You have to be recreated. Something has to change inside of you that you can't do. And we look at the detail um, it's not by the will of man, but it's by it's by the will of God. We saw that back in, in several weeks ago when we were back in John chapter 1 when we were in verse 13. Not by the will of flesh, by human blood, but by God that that happens. And it's all through the New Testament. James chapter 1 talks about that, that, um, that it's God who gave his life. Ephesians 2 said we are made alive together with Christ. Made alive together. That's that recreation that happens. In that Titus 3 says, by the washing and regeneration, that rebirth within us. First Peter says that we are begotten again. 
over and over, the, the New Testament talks about being born again, born again. And in, uh, in John 3 and verse 4, then Nicodemus says, How can a man be born when he is old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Now, now notice something here. Nicodemus doesn't say, when Jesus says, he must be born again, he tells him, Jesus says, well, what are you talking about? Why are you talking about that? I ask you a different question. He knew. He knew that Jesus was, was reading what was in his heart as, as he answers. And, and Jesus gives this analogy about birth. Nicodemus lives in the world of analogies. That's how they taught. That's how the Pharisees and the rabbis, that's how they taught people, was with, with these picture stories and things along the way. So Jesus says, well, this is a guy of analogies. I'll give him one. <laughs> you have to be born again. And, and uh, he says, how can you be, old, be born again when you're old? Um, but, but Nicodemus jumps in and follows that analogy. He's not... He's, he's trying to understand what Jesus is telling him, but he's not lost in this conversation. When Jesus tells him that, he jumps on in and says, okay, okay, be born again. But how can you be born again when you're old? <laughs> if someone gives you, gives us a riddle, right, what do we ask for? Give me a clue. Give me a hint, right? I, okay, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to follow this. I'm trying to think about this, but give me a hint. And he does. Jesus does this in both in, in verse 5 and in, in verse 6. Um, because remember, he comes back to this and he says, in, in, in verse 10, Jesus says, How can you be the teacher of Israel and not understand these things? And, and so he, he comes back and he, he gives these clues. So he says, I'll give you a clue. Verse 5, And once one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. Well, I want to debunk a few things. Debunk's a buzzword, right? We talk about now with things <laughs> right now, but here's some things to think about. Uh, man, I've done a lot of reading and a lot of study and, and, uh, on these, and digging deep into some of these things, and it, it's, it's really amazing. It's God unfolds some things that, in the Old Testament. But he says a lot of traditional texts or sermons will say, well, he must be talking about human birth, water, and then and then spiritual birth, spirit. In the days of the first century, the days that Jesus walked upon this earth, they didn't have the phrase in their language about someone's water breaking. They didn't talk about it in pregnancies. They didn't talk about somebody being dilated and all the different stuff that happened. It was a different world. It was a very private world that went on with that. This would not be an analogy that would come to Nicodemus's mind in that, because that wasn't the talk of the day, right? We talk we talk about that now a lot, right? With in pregnancies and the different things and, and child delivery and those things that happen, but that was not the time. Look, look deeper, look deeper he, in, in, into the passage. Nicodemus' expertise was where? The Old Testament, of course, right? He knew the Old Testament. He, would, he had tons of the Old Testament committed to memory in, in doing that. What is his expertise in the Old Testament? What would ring a bell to Nicodemus? Well, if you want to turn with me, we're going to go back to Ezekiel. Yeah, otherwise you can just listen and follow along. The Old Testament prophet of Ezekiel, chapter 36 and God is telling them about salvation in this passage, and he's giving to the prophet Ezekiel to say this, tell my people this about their salvation, and listen for the I will. God is speaking, the I will. And he says in the passage, beginning chapter 36, verse 20, 25, and he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. 
You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people, and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. <coughs> God gives that picture <laughs> of that salvation. And there it is. There's the water in the Spirit. He just, he just told them that in Ezekiel. I'm going to water upon you and cleanse you and wash you. And then he talks about the, the spiritual and the water both happening together. If you turn on over the page to chapter 37 in Ezekiel, we get this incredible picture. We know the story. You've, you've heard a little bit about the dry bones, right? That's what's here. The dry bones. The, the prophecy, the vision that is given to to Ezekiel here in, in Ezekiel chapter 37, he says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. He, he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to those bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and I was prophesying. There was a noise and a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone, and I looked. And tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the, to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe, and to be slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. And they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. And when I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. That picture of dry bones, and these are the passages that are going to be in Nicodemus' head when he's talking about the water and the spirit and these things happening. And he knows these great prophecies about the saving of the nation of Israel and, and then the saving of the individuals. Both are in those passages uh, that are prophesied in these new covenant passages. And so we, we see all of this happen. And, and Jesus turns to him and says, how can you be the teacher of Israel? You know this Old Testament and I say these things and you don't understand them when I tell you this. All of this says that he, God says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And it's given him heart and disposition, wash, cleanse, and all of these things that will happen to you. How do you not understand that? And then he gives the second, the second clue, the second hint. I'm back to John chapter three now, and we'll stay, we'll stay in there. In John chapter three, he says, "Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit." By the way, in the end, of the other part of, of the previous verse, when he says, "Born of the water and the spirit," the other thing that some people talk about is, well, he must be talking about baptism, water, and then the spirit. New Testament baptism didn't become a thing until Acts chapter, uh, about chapter 8, I believe, along the way in the notes. It was not anything that demons had heard of before, okay? <laughs> that wasn't the reference either. It's, it's back in the Ezekiel and Jeremiah. There's passages we didn't look at, but are there to talk about the same things happening. And then he, so he gives them this other hand, flesh gives birth to flesh. And there's a foundational principle here that that uh, that uh, you guys have overlooked. He says, um, the flesh gives birth only to flesh. Flesh can't give birth to spirit. You are trying in your flesh and your humanness to do all of these right things. 
to enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, no matter how hard you try as human beings, in your own flesh, in your own works, in your own knowledge, and own it's not going to get it done because flesh cannot give birth to spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. The spirit gives birth to spirit in that. And so, and he gives that hint. And, and we can see all through, uh, there, uh, there's again Old Testament passages that, that, that talk about that, and I won't take the time to read all of them, but Job, uh, Job chapter 15, um, Eliphaz says, What is the man that he should be pure? Or, or who is born of a woman that he could be righteous? He knows, they, they even knew, and Job later says, We can't do this on our own. We're, we're sinful people. <laughs> we need something outside of man to save us. Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately wicked. They knew the heart of man. They knew that flesh only gave birth to flesh, that, that, that we could not become spiritual beings in that. The Old Testament teaches all that. Man needs a complete spiritual rebirth. He needs to be washed. He needs to be transformed and have his heart replaced in this process. And it's not something we can do because flesh produces and Jesus says in verse, verse 7, he looks at Nicodemus again. Uh, Nicodemus, I mean, give me kudos. He came to see Jesus. He's asking the questions. He wants to understand. But when Jesus says, truly I say to you, and begin, remember every time he says, truly I say to you, or truly, truly, as you look at your translation, every time of the 25 times that we see that in Gospel of John, Jesus is looking at him and saying, I'm giving you a new principle that you have never heard before. You don't get this, but let me tell you. Truly I say to you, you must be born, born again. And he gets to him, and, and he, in verse 7 he says that uh, you should not be surprised what I'm saying. <laughs> you should follow this, Nicodemus. You know all the things of the Old Testament. And that gets us to that final thing of the Spirit's work. In verse 6 he says, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. The Spirit gives birth to Spirit. And he gives him another analogy in verse 8. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear the sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Any of y'all able to control the wind? Step outside and say, well, it's warm today, Lord. Just make the wind blow. I, I just, I'm just going to make the wind go. Too windy for that. I'm not doing something today. I'll just stop the wind. <laughs> Doesn't work for us, does it? We can't control the wind. It's a thing from above. Our salvation is a God thing. The wind. We can't, we can't control the wind. And he's, so he gives him this other analogy. John chapter 5, verse 21, he says, The Son gives life to whomever he will. Right? That is a thing of God that happens along the way. It's God who, who, who raises us to new, to, to new life. It's God that does that regeneration in our heart. Nicodemus says, how can this be? His head is spinning. <laughs> I am trying to grasp hold of this, and you're telling me these things, and it's, it's all different than I was ever taught. And it's all different than I've been teaching for years. It's not about keeping the laws and keeping rules and keeping things. It's about surrendering and saying, God, I can't do any of this. But it's all in your hands. God, I am not able. I, I am not. I don't have the ability. It's a God thing that happens. It's a God thing that happens. The Spirit gives birth to Spirit. It's the work of the Spirit of God that happens in the heart of a person when they surrender. When we quit trying to do it on our own and say, God, I can't do this on my own. Then God says, okay. <laughs> but I can. And he does it. What happens to Nicodemus in all of this? Nicodemus disappears. We see, we see him before this. We see him in John chapter 3. We see him sit down with this conversation with Jesus and then we don't see him for a while, but he shows up again in John chapter 7. 
Nicodemus has not become a believer in John chapter 3 at that, at that conversation, but he's asking the questions, and his mind is scrambling, and he's trying to understand and grasp all of what's being told to him. And in John chapter 7, verse 45, they're having a debate between with the people and the Pharisees about this teacher Jesus and getting him and doing something with him because he is he is creating havoc in their lives in all of this. In, in John 7, 45, it says, Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked him, Why didn't you bring him, meaning Jesus, why didn't you bring him in? And they said, No one ever spoke the way this man does. They said, You mean he deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted. Has any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but... But this mom that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? They replied, Are you a Galilean too? Look into it, you will find that a prophet does not come from Galilee. So we see all of a sudden, they're having this meeting. They want to get Jesus in. And though he doesn't, he doesn't, Say that I believe in Jesus at this point. He doesn't do that. This is this is two years after that first conversation. But he says, "Yeah, but our law doesn't allow us to convict a man unless we talk to him first, right? Unless we question him and understand it." So he's defending Jesus indirectly at that point. And and, and then if you flip on over to John chapter nineteen, he shows up again, doesn't he? Nicodemus in John chapter 19 after this is after the crucifixion of Christ, John 19 and verse 38 it says, later Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and alloys, 75, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial custom. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, which no one never laid, because it was the Jewish day of preparation. Since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. And Nicodemus comes and makes that somewhere in that way, from that end of two years in to three years after that initial conversation, when Christ is crucified upon the cross, Nicodemus shows up. And he brings spices and myrrh, which they would wrap the body in. But the more you brought, the more you showed honor. 75 pounds, he says, a 75 pound bag of stuff that he brings. To prepare Christ's body for burial. He come to show him honor. The same man that he sat across the table from, he said, I don't understand how, what are these things? How can I be born when I'm old? Helped to wrap Jesus' body. He held him in his arms as he put that linen around him and placed him in the tomb. God had done a work in his life <laughs> in that process. Nicodemus had reached that point. He says, this, I, God, I can't do this. He says, no. God says, no, but I can. And he transformed the heart of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is there. What else happens to Nicodemus? Scripture doesn't tell us, but there are some other writings of the day that help give us some information. In the process, there's a historical uh, record of a man, and they don't call him Nicodemus, but there's a historical record of a man who says he stood up at Jesus' trial before Pilate and defended him. He confessed of the Lord Jesus so boldly that it led to him being deprived of his office, deprived of his position as a teacher, and deprived of all his entire fortune. All his property, all his possessions were taken from him, and he was banished from Jerusalem by the Sanhedrin that he had served. Then some centuries later, there's another writing by a man named Photius. He refers to an ancient document that refer, records someone named Nicodemus that was martyred in the first century for his devotion to Christ. He was beaten to death by a mob. 
He lost everything in this world to gain everything in the world to come. What do we do with this story? John 6, 37 says, He that comes to me, I will not cast away. When we are at our end, when we understand we can't do it on our own, <laughs> when we quit trying to just be, do good things, right? do right things to earn our salvation, that's when God says, now you're ready for me. Now you're ready for me. Now we're commanded to do good things, right? But all of that is after after Christ has done his work within us. So much of our world is trying to enter the, enter the kingdom of God by doing good things, trying to do the right thing, trying to do right things. I try to read my Bible, I go to the, I try to do, I try to help my neighbor, I try to do. Unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And that born again is nothing that we can do in our own surrender to God and say I don't have the ability to do that God but I know that you do and we let it and whether you need to do that today and quit trying to do all the right things and just receive the work of the Holy Spirit in your life to regenerate that heart within you or whether you need to share that message with people that you may see today or next week or next month or wherever Doing good things doesn't get us to the kingdom of heaven. Only Jesus Christ does that. Father God, we are so thankful. We are so thankful for this message. Father, what an amazing story we see with Nicodemus. A man who came and eventually gave up everything that he had earned, that he had worked for in this life. He had spent his whole life 